Andrew, last meeting, do you want to do the honors and open? You got it. You're the chair, my friend. <laughs> I'll, I'll, just, I'll see you for a minute. All right. A um, minute. <laughs> One minute on the clock. All right. So we will we will begin this meeting of the Montpelier Roxbury Public School Board at 6.34 p.m. I don't have an agenda in front of me just yet, so give me a second here. Uh, I don't think you need one. Yeah. Public comment. Stuff writing, but I think you were asked to read. I'm happy to read that if that's helpful. Is that? Yeah, if you want to, Joe, go I, ahead. I'm get in here. And maybe in the in the meantime, if people want to do public comment that are on Zoom, we could yeah. start by raising their hands so that we could get. Um, yeah, great call. Yeah, actually, yeah. on. Oh, oh, I see. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, I wonder if we can get a sense of how many public. Because we have a lot of people on the call, and if we have a bunch, I think we should, because we have a time limit on our um, presenter from uh, the Vermont Equity Coalition. So I, if we have a bunch of people on public comment, we might just have to do like 30 seconds or a minute. So um, do you can, mind if I give quick instructions on how to raise hands? Yes. Yeah, Someone, please. So if you're on Zoom and you're interested in speaking, the best way to let us know is to go, if you click down at the bottom to the participant list, it will open up a participant list off to the right. And then once the participant list is open, you should be able to scroll and find your name. Usually it's at the top. And then um, click on reactions, right? At the bottom and yes. raise hand. And I see three um, raised hands. I see like Joel, Lincoln, and Lisa, and Al. And I see Ethan. And then Ethan is, is actually raising, raising his hand. Yeah. Yeah. It actually looks like you could just click on reactions at the bottom. There's yes, a toolbar at the bottom. Faster. Click on reactions. And then um, you might need to click on more. There's a whole bunch of different reactions, like clapping hands and a coffee cup and all of that. And then you have to click on the raise hand button. Sorry, Ethan. We, 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 we saw your hand. We'll, we'll get to you. All right, should we just go? So are we going to start with Jill? Jill, do you want to read first and then? Sure, I'm reading um, comments that were just sent to us at the board um, by Jolinda Burton. Um, to the MRPS school board, I would appreciate if you would include the following in tonight's public comments. I apologize, I cannot be there in person. My thoughts are regarding yesterday's letter from Superintendent Libby Bonesteel to district families regarding the change of in-school mask mandate announced yesterday. Listening to the governor's press conference yesterday, which included data and context from Health Commissioner Levine and Education Secretary French, I understood this shift in recommendation to be a result of weighing the science and medical data, balancing the overall public health cost and benefit, and to be a determination that the cost of wearing masks all day in school is no longer justified by the benefit from a medical and epidemiological perspective. In her letter yesterday, Libby shared this change in mandate not with that data and context, but with opinion that while it will now be a personal decision, wearing masks in school is still the right thing to do. Libby equated students continuing to wear a mask with caring for each other after parentheses, after the Vermont Health Department sanctioned removing masks in school, period. I found that at minimum confusing and at most potentially divisive among students and staff, what about caring for those with anxiety around wearing masks or who can barely be understood through a mask? This district has navigated the pandemic incredibly well, I think most would agree, and it's been by following the state's medical and scientific data and advice. This letter, however, diverges from that without giving data-based reasoning. The letter references, quote, positive cases still occurring in our community, end quote, as a reason to continue wearing masks. So what will the MRPS administration choose as a low enough bar to remove masks? And are health professionals consulted on that? The mental health of MRPS students and families two years into this is not good. Students, many too young to grasp what we're living through, have been told to stay away from each other, stay silent while eating, only play with certain groups, stay in line rather than run around outside and cover their noses and mouths, but still manage to be discernible by each other parentheses, not to mention trying to understand what all the masked adults are saying, and parentheses. Masks have been a key mitigation tool in the transmission of COVID, but now our state administration recommends that to balance our mental and physical health of our students, it's time to drop masks in school, time for kids to fully see and hear each other again. 
I'm not an educator, but I know a little about transitions and I humbly suggest that the schools plan to transition students from wearing masks all day to not wearing them at all. Wait, sorry, to not wearing them all day. Start by removing masks outside and incorporating eating lunch in the cafeteria. For those that would like them, add in-class mask breaks when students have plenty of space and so on. Make it an opportunity for students to practice empathy and inclusion with their classmates. We can follow the guidance and be gentle with our children at the same time. Students and much of the community have been working really hard to get to a point where it is safe to do this. We can make this moment an opportunity to share the joy and hard won fruits of our labor with them and with each other. I appreciate your time and the opportunity to be heard. Sincerely, Jolinda Burton, parent of second grader and kindergartner. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, yeah. Joe. And just um, since we have a number of public comments in case it's your first time attending a board meeting, I just want to qualify that the board receives input during public comments, but unless it's a public session set up for an exchange, the board doesn't typically go back and forth so that we can move through um, our agenda in a timely fashion, just so everyone is aware. Please feel free to reach out to us again outside of the board meeting um, if you'd like to have a conversation. Uh, anyone else want to add anything? There? Yeah, a couple things. I think given the fact that we have uh, time limits for people on the agenda, um, please keep your minutes, your comments to one minute or less. Less would be better. Um, Try not to repeat something someone has said. You can endorse it without resaying it. Um, and uh, I, I don't mean to limit public comment at all, but um, if if this drags out for too long, we're um, we're going to lose time for people who who prepare presentations for the board. Um, so thank you. All right, let's start with Joel. Thank you. Uh, I also applaud the move away from mandated masking in Montpelier Public Schools. Uh, we'll never live in a world without managed risk, but we still climb trees, take our kids hiking in tick-ridden woods, swim in muddy lakes. We still ski and sled and snowboard. Life is too rich to hide from it, even if that makes us a tiny bit safer. My three children, including two with special needs that are specifically impacted by having their faces covered and the faces of others hidden, deserve every opportunity afforded to the generations before them. The privilege to smile and to be seen. And we deserve district leadership that does not frame us as uncaring villains. That's all. Thanks. Thanks, Joel. Thanks, Joel. Thanks for the brevity. Lincoln and Liza. Hi, thanks. Um, I want to cheer for this um, decision and also share Jolinda's concerns about the framing. Um, with the letter saying that an action that shows we care may be to continue to wear a mask. And um, I, I really think it's um, from that letter, I, if I were a teacher in our school district, I would not feel comfortable unmasking for my class. And I think it's really important that we also show that a sign of caring is unmasking so your students can hear you better. And so that your friends who are English language learners can see your lips or your friends who are hard of hearing and um, that care could mean smiling to a peer. I personally know two high school youth in this district at Montpelier High School who have been suicidal this year. One has attempted suicide and I know a seventh grader in another school district. So literally unmasking and smiling could save a life of your peer. And so I really hope that the leadership of our school district can reframe what it means to care in many diverse ways. As a teacher for the past 20 years, my smile has always been my most important tool, establishing community, reassuring after a mistake, adding humor, reduces anxiety and promotes moods. I do worry about the timing of this. There has been an uptick in cases after every single vacation. So I want to caution us that an uptick in cases is not to be blamed on the unmasking and that we need to prepare for that and hold strong because cases are going down. I think it's great the antigen test that will go out. So hopefully people use those and will just not come to the school um, if they test positive. I also want to point out in the press conference yesterday, Secretary French 
um, specifically referred to some local mitigations um, that have been in practice that should not have been in practice. And these are masking kids outdoors. That goes against the guidance of the Vermont Department of Ed from this fall and having kids not speak during classes. The elementary school kids have been watching movies every day in their classroom so that they're not talking. And Secretary French said, absolutely not, that kids need to talk during lunch and they need to be able to see each other's faces at recess. So I just hope we can reflect on that as a community Montpelier rallies around going above and beyond the recommendations. And I think that actually we need to be aware that this can cause more damage um, than good. And I would just add a couple of points to what speakers have said before. Um, what hasn't been mentioned is a concern that I have that we are explicitly at this point um, linking taking masks off to vaccination status. So I see that our school district is not going to be inviting the youngest kids, the pre-K kids to be unmasking. Um, and I think that that's, that sounds like it's based on them not being available to get vaccines and that school districts that haven't reached the 80% mark are also um, being discriminated against to not have their kids have a choice. That, 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 and, and Roxbury included in that in our school district, that that feels wrongly coercive to me as a parent in our community that everybody has the opportunity and has heard the arguments for this mitigation. And if people are deciding not to do it, then they shouldn't be penalized for that. And all the data about our pre-K kids are clear from my perspective, from what I've read, that the risks to their development far outweigh the, the very small uh, risks that they have from COVID and, and having bad illness or ramifications from COVID. So I, I encourage us to reconsider uh, as a school district, those two milestones. That's all. All right, Alex Brush. Hi, um, I'm a 10th grader at MHS. I wasn't planning on speaking. I just, I have the letter yesterday caught me off guard. Um, I live with my grandparents and who's, who are immunocompromised as well as my high risk stepfather. And I directly oppose this, even though I know it's a state decision, not a directly based on you guys. And I just wanna make sure y'all are like putting all the precautions to make sure COVID doesn't spread, which it inevitably will with um, the lift of mandatory uh, maskings and wanna make sure y'all just know that this is gonna directly harm the student body of not only Montpelier High School, but all the schools in the district. Thanks, Alex. Ethan. I'm not. Ethan Park. Uh, <clears throat> yes, thank you. Um, I would just like to endorse uh, the speakers ahead of me who have um, applauded the lifting of the school mask mandate. I'd also like to thank our superintendent for her email yesterday. Um, I know there's been some uh, <clears throat> friction around the framing, but I still think that she has taken a courageous position and it's a position that appears to be in line with uh, the governor and the health commissioner and the uh, secretary of education. So uh, I'm all in favor of lifting this mandate. I'm the father of a third grader at UES. Thank you. Thank you, Ethan. All right, I think that's all the public comments and less I'm missing one. I don't think I am. You could offer to, if people didn't get to figure out how to raise their hand, you could just unmute and say that you have public comment. If anybody else has an additional comment, please unmute yourself and, and let us know. Seeing none. All right, we're gonna move forward with the consent agenda. He, he, they, they already they, spoke. Apologies. Um, I will, uh, I move the consent agenda with the addition of the third resignation letter. 
and the um, appointment of Christina Kimball to business manager. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. So did you want to discuss the those two items? No, we just had to add them verbally. Oh, add them? Okay. Them. They weren't written right. on the consent agenda. Right. Good. Sorry about that. <laughs> I didn't know why you were both Yeah, I, at me. Yeah, I was like, yeah, when you said those, I, I like to usually you remove them. So oh. my, uh, nope. my brain was, was going on autopilot. Yeah, mine did the same. And in fact, <laughs> I just realized I had the plumber just out there. Um, all right, so board discussion, student representation on the board. You want to take the lead on this? Yeah, so um, just for context, for those who are listening, uh, this board has almost always had a student representative or two um, as part of the board. And that sort of fell off the radar during COVID. And we are reviving that practice of having student representatives on the board. We put out a call to students in um, high school and I think also middle school. Is that right, Libby? Say that again, two from middle school? I'm did sorry. We end, did we end up extending the offer to middle school students or no? I if, you didn't, if you didn't do it, we didn't do it. Okay, I remember having an email, it's okay, but I remember having an email exchange with you where I asked if you wanted me to reach out to the principal, if you would prefer to reach out to the principal on that. Anyway, there was a couple of middle school students that reached out, they had heard about the opportunity, but they didn't end up applying. So we did extend it to um, high, the high school students and Matt McLean helped us um, sort of spread the word. If any high school student was interested in serving on the board that they could apply. Um, they had about a month to do so, and many of them, or all of them, are here tonight to address the board, and then we'll discuss um, the appointments. We're going to be appointing two student representatives to the board, and um, I believe the, the idea being that they would serve through the end of the school year. Is that correct, Jim? Yes. Yeah. Um, so we'll, we'll be doing that during executive session. And then when we come back from executive session, we'll announce the, the two appointments. And if um, people are not present, the, if the applicants are not present when we announce, I will just be sending out an email to all applicants letting you know um, who was appointed. So I think we can go ahead and, and allow the students who came to address the board about their interest in, in serving in this capacity. Sounds great. Um, how about we just go in the order that they're listed on the agenda? Does that Perfect. work? Perfect. Let's do it. So, Merrick, you're listed first. <laughs> so, yeah, if you could come to the table just so that you're at that microphone, right. that'd be great. All right. Members of the Montpelier Roxbury Public Schools Board, good evening. My name is Merrick Moden, and I'm a junior at Montpelier High School. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak with you all and to present the reasons why I should be your next student representative. Now, what would I bring to the school board? Well, first, I'm an active and contributing member in various groups, including Montpelier High School's Gender and Sexuality Alliance, Racial Justice Alliance, and Student Council, to groups in our community, such as Montpelier's Complete Streets Commission, as well as the recently formed MRPS Vision Committee, among others. I will be able to draw from all these places when bringing my voice and input to every meeting. I cannot understate the importance of this. Having a wide range of views that I, and thus the board, can take into consideration when discussing significant issues is extremely valuable. Additionally, I would be a valuable representative because I provide an LGBTQ plus perspective myself. Second, the very reason I stand before you all today is because I am passionate about change and helping our community improve and thrive. I care deeply about my peers' voices and the school community, and I want to do everything I can to ensure that everyone across the district is adequately heard and represented. As a measure of this, if appointed, I can commit right now to working with the other student representative to organize regular meetings across the district where we can gauge what our fellow peers want to focus on and bring to the school board. Third, I'm a strong listener, planner, and hard worker. The various commitments that I have and dedication that I have to those highlights these traits and also show that I am prepared for the extra work that being a student representative will require. 
Now, I want to thank you all for your time, consideration, and enthusiasm in this process. And I sincerely hope that you select me as your next representative. Thank you and have a good evening. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mary. Okay, the next person is uh, Meg. Oh, that's it. <laughs> no Hi, I'm Meg Bojan. Um, I'm a 10th grader here at the high school. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I'm a part of many sports and clubs here at the high school, including the student council and also earth group. Um, I do sports season, all three seasons that we offer them and I have a widespread like experience with different communities at the school. Um, I think it's a really awesome opportunity that we have student voice that could be on this board now. I know there was a little gap, and I think it's really great that we're bringing it back in um, making decisions as part of this board. Thank you. Thank you. Um, is, is Caleb, Caleb, are you on Zoom? Have you joined us via Zoom? I can't see all of the participants. So if you are... Yeah. If you are present, if you could unmute yourself, and they could be joined from somebody else's computer. Right. <laughs> okay, looks like Caleb, Caleb wasn't able to join us, but if, if Caleb, if you are there and you want to speak later, we can move you to the bottom of the line. Um, Maeve. Hello, my name is Maeve Byrne. I'm a current junior at Montclair High School. I would be a good member on your board because I am a hardworking student who is part of many sports and clubs at our school. With my hard work, I know that people need to be represented, especially in this unprecedented time of COVID. Our students need to know that their voices are being heard, that they are safe, and that we're gonna do everything in our power to like make their experience at the school better. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Maeve. Um, Noel, it looks like you are joined via Zoom. Would you like to address the board? You could unmute and speak. Hi, um, I'm Noel Westbaum, and I would like to join the like to give my perspective to the school board because I've had a lot of different educational experiences in the past and. I am also very passionate about being able to improve our community in any way possible. Um, thank you for offering this opportunity to people to school. Thank you so much. Thanks, Noel. Okay, um, Zachary, I see that you're you've joined. Would you like to address the board? Yeah. Um, hi, folks. My name is Zach Henningsen. I'm a junior at Montpelier High School, and I want to thank you for taking the time to consider my peers and I as student representatives on the school board. The inclusion of students' voices is vital to any equitable and functioning school system, and I'm incredibly grateful that our district is offering this opportunity in the first place. My interest in this position stems from the main principle of including students' voices. I previously served on the School Resource Officer Oversight Committee with a few of my peers, and that experience only led me to wonder what more could be done for the school district community as a whole. One of the tasks we did for that work was survey stakeholder groups, parents, students, faculty, and community members. For all the students on the survey who answered about how uncomfortable and just how unsafe they felt at school, how can we stand to support them? Students and teachers are the ones living the reality of being in the building every day, and especially in a time like COVID, it is essential to hear from the affected populations. Another part of my interest is directly connected to the work I do with Outright Vermont as a youth organizer. I actually participated in facilitating a space of LGBTQ plus community members in regards to ESSER funding. And the reason for my participation in that facilitation, as I was told when I arrived at the meeting, was because no one on the current school board identified as LGBTQ plus. As an LGBTQ plus person in this district, hearing that only further motivated me to apply. How can a board support the needs of an entire group of people whose voices are often underrepresented if no one there shares the lived experience, especially in regards to supporting trans youth? The fact that there even was 
an opportunity for students and community members to come share about their needs in regards to the ESSER funding shows that the board is aware that input is needed and I've encouraged the board to continue the inclusion of dis different perspectives and voices. Student input and advocacy should be easily accessible and including students on the board who represent underserved communities is the first step to making everyone feel safe and supported in and out of the school building. Thank you for your time and consideration and I hope you all have a good night. Thank you so much, Zach. Thanks, Zach. Um, yeah, I, I know that after we received all of the letters of interest, I got a lot of emails from my fellow board members just expressing profuse thanks for all of you who have applied. Um, it's, it's a really great candidate pool and we're, we're just so thrilled and excited that you all applied. So thank you so much. Um, we're gonna move to the other part of our agenda with the waiting study. Um, did you did you want to? We don't want to do any questions or anything like that. No, we don't. I mean, I want to reiterate the thanks. Uh, yeah, um, the interest was overwhelming. I've been on the board for what going on six or seven years now, and we've never had this many people um, step up. And I know it took a little hiatus, but even before then, you know, the, the interest level uh, is through the roof this year, and, and I really appreciate everyone. Stepping up and wanting to do this is a really important thing, and, and uh, it's, it's a you know just thank you, and, and it's amazing to see this much interest in, in the board. So really, really appreciate it. So yeah, we have one more agenda item, and then we will move into executive session, and then we'd likely be back here around eight. Well, depending on how it goes, yeah, um, I mean, around eight thirty. I know it's seven now. Um, it, it might be a long night for 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 you all, so I, I might yeah you know, maybe tune in on Zoom. It's up to you. It's up to you. But. Everyone, you know, on Zoom or in person, you're welcome to stay or go. Um, I will definitely be emailing after the meeting yeah. uh, the decision that was made, and also you're able to access either the Zoom feed or the live YouTube either way. So, but I just don't want you to feel like you're beholden to to stay either on Zoom or in person. Okay. And we'll we'll communicate with everyone who applied, right? Yes. Okay. Immediately after the meeting, I'll send an email. Yeah, and I'll tell you right now that we wish we could give you all seats. So. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. So Coalition of Vermont Student Equity. Uh, hi, good evening. Um, my name is Mark Schauber. I'm the executive director. The Coalition for Vermont Student Equity. Um, I'm here tonight with um, Alex and Rory, um, and I'm going to turn it over to them to do a brief presentation for you. Um, I was wondering whether I could share my screen. I've got a, a few slides for you all. I think so. Anna yeah. is. Libby is Lib giving us a thumbs up. Okay, great. Yes. So, yes, you can. Great. You should be able to, Mark. Let me know if you can't. Okay. Thanks, Libby. Oh, wait. Can you see my screen? Yep, yes. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Excellent. Um, and this this presentation is also available um, at uh, mrps.cvtse.org. Uh, it's a PDF that uh, that you can download. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to um, Rory and, and Alex. Good evening. I'm Roy Tebow. I'm the Cabot School Board Chair, and I'm one of the directors for the Coalition for Vermont Student Equity. And I want to share, uh, we'll go to the next slide, and just start off with a brief overview of who we are, a little bit of the history of why this is a hot topic today, and uh, then where we're heading in this uh, current legislative session. So the Vermont Coalition for Student Equity was formed last year in response to um, forward movement on uh, in legislative action on the 2019 pupil waiting factors report. And in a broad sense, this is the first um, hard look at Vermont's education finance system or the most comprehensive look at our system since uh, the time of Brigham and Act 60 back in the late 90s. So the coalition exists today uh, really to advocate for um, ensuring that Vermont's ed general education fund and other funds are equitably distributed to uh, districts that need them in a way that uh, fits uh, really Vermont values and is consistent with the empirical data collected in that weighting factors report. 
The coalition is comprised of school board members, superintendents, business managers, legislators, and a few other members of the general public. Um, and if we could go to the next slide. There's a significant amount of geographic reach. Uh, member districts are spread throughout 11 counties, representing 80 different towns and cities and about 19,000 of Vermont's current student population. One of the things I like to remark on is this, that if you look at the map, it's we're geographically distributed throughout the state. And a lot of the districts that are participating on face, if you take them at face value, you wouldn't necessarily have a lot in common. And I think that highlights the reality that uh, while the post Brigham and Act 60 structure worked well for a long time, the time has come to take a hard look at it. And that's particularly a true point. Uh, my home district of Cabot and a district like Peachum are about as different as you can get in terms of uh, population size, both being very rural communities versus uh, member communities such as uh, Winooski or Burlington, for example, which are really um, the heart of our metropolitan part of Vermont up in Chittenden County. Uh, so with that said, um, there's a broad range of uh, stakeholders who are interested throughout the state. So how we got here, as mentioned before, uh, over 25 years ago, the Brigham decision uh, required that Vermont students have substantially equal educational opportunities. And that meant uh, breaking down the barriers of property rich towns versus property poor towns and uh, the struggle that came with that. Of course, integral to this, as you are no strangers to as school board members, um, we live and die when it comes to tax rate and other factors by uh, the number of equalized pupils that we have. It's foundational to the system that we divide our education spending by that number. Um, however, uh, just you know, stratifying students by, by number based on whether in high school, middle school, or elementary school, or pre-K doesn't necessarily address or speak to particular demographic needs or uh, the needs of those communities. And this is particularly cute as Alex will talk about when we start considering things like English language learners in our community and the impacts of poverty. So in the last two, three years, there's been a substantial move to really studying this issue and understanding how we should best weight uh, pupils for purposes of looking at tax rate and taxing capacity in these communities. Next slide, please. So final thoughts before I, I turn this over to Alex to take over uh, the presentation. Um, you know, the weights are important for a number of reasons. And when we look, I think that when making a pitch to another school board as a school board member, um, there's another option out there called cost equity that would effectively be um, for a district like Cabot, we look at it as a small school grant and steroids, this uncertain number each year coming from the agency of education mm -hmm. based upon some similar factors, but different uh, in terms of more or less granting, sending grant money or in effect subsidizing districts. We believe in, in the coalition that weights are better, namely because it's predictable, it shifts with demographics. And I think um, you know, Vermont is poised for some significant demographic changes in the near future, especially as we consider at a, a systems and policy level, the addition of refugee families to our communities or those from out of state, the likelihood of different demographics and particularly more English language learners in our system are particularly acute. And we think that staying with the weight system is more predictable and easier to manage at uh, the district level. So with that, I'll turn this over to Alex, who's going to have some more comments and uh, talk about uh, some more of what the coalition is doing and where we stand today. Hi, my name is Alex um, Yin, and I'm, I'm also a member of the Coalition for Vermont Student Equity, but I'm also on the school board for Winooski. And there's often like many like changes when you're thinking about like why weights versus grants and Weights to me, and just as a simplified form, it's just the notion that it costs certain weights allow us to better adjust to see um, the, the, the accounts for students because we know that um, educationally that it costs more to educate certain st students or it costs, and I hate to use the word costs, it's really about investment. It, it, we need certain investments to help educate certain students to reach a equal level of outcomes. And, and that's how we see it play out in, in Winooski in the sense that we know that um, um, it, it does have additional costs for the students that we serve, not because necessarily just also in the classroom, but because of things like how do we translate our materials um, for our Eng English language learners parents, um, because we, we find it invaluable for our students to also have their families be involved in education, things that um, that there are characteristics of things that sometimes when you're in the majority crowd that you take 
for granted and you don't know. And, and one of the reasons why we prefer weights over grants is that grants sometimes come from legislation and they make mandates on how you have to spend the money to a certain way and then you have to document it in every format. And it takes away the local control, whereas weights, it's about giving us the general fund and allowing the superintendent and the school board the flexibility to actually use the money for the student, for the programs that we believe that are important. Um, as you all well know that um, we're moving to a universal design learning type of format too, to make it really more inclusive. And having that integration of our students, um, English language learners with um, our other students enriches the educational experience of all students. Um, and I think that is just way too difficult when we think about grants. And as I've mentioned in many ways when I've been testifying is that like, it's hard to hold legislators in a different county accountable for the grants that they're gonna give us. Whereas I want to be accountable being a school board member in my school district and showing that we're educating students. And as a school board member, I am constantly also looking out for the outcomes of our students in terms of what are they meeting. And there are some outcomes when, when I sit in on our jam pose and Winooski, which are our, our demonstration of um, proficiency education in our school, that I've been impressed. And, um, I, and I know that that's why I believe in the faith of our local school board and why I think weights are the way to go um, as opposed to grants. Um, next slide, Mark. So where are we today in, in, in many ways? And, and when you look at it, um, like the Senate finance drafted a bill deciding between, they're, they're trying to decide between cost equity and weights, which is cost equity is like reverse funding grants and stuff. Um, Senate education has, is deciding between EL as a grant versus EL as a weight and using a, potentially a hybrid approach. House Ways and Means are working on the education finance restructuring likely to receive a bill from the Senate. And the House education hasn't even started on the people waiting but are waiting to discuss as a possible Act 173. So there's still so much work, but we all have agreed around the legislation and all this is that the current system is not working and we need to make changes. And we're hoping that by a school district like you joining us will help us move further in actually creating a more equitable education funding system. Next slide, Mark. Um, so this is how the kind of impact that would have on the different models and simulations. Um, we can get more into details. Um, there's the link here for you to look at what it means in terms of your taxing capacity. And remember, taxing capacity does not mean necessarily your tax rate. It's just giving you the option and the flexibility on how, how you will, um, how much money you can actually use and then convince your um, residents to actually vote and support the educational needs of your students and stuff. And here's how it works in the different levels. I think, I, I gotta admit, like sometimes this gets get way into the weeds and I'm sure Mark or Rory or I would be happy to speak more in detail off, offline or, or even more to go through the mathematical equations that you need to go in understanding our um, taxing system. And finally, I just want to, before we leave um, and, and, and really open it up for questions from the board, um, the next slide just basically says, if you're thinking about joining us, um, there's no membership dues, but because we, 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 we are all volunteers, I, I got to admit, like, we all have our day jobs on top of the school board, but then, um, so we have actually helped get externals help with the lobbyists, and so donations are strongly encouraged. This is are really our only source of revenue to help pay for our lobbyists to make sure that they um, keep us informed of what's going on on a day-to-day -day -day basis of what's going on. Um, the AOE's general counsel has said donations to um, a 510C4 such as CVSTSE are an acceptable use of state educational fund. Just to give you a hint, um, just last week, our school board in Winooski actually authorized a $2,000 um, contribution to this because we know how important it is for um, this um, for us to work on it. And I'll, I'll just leave, um, if you're interested in joining, make sure you contact Mark, but I just leave this one final note, like when we started on this journey of a bunch of school boards came together, I, I, I actually set out, came out strong and told the group, like the only reason I'm doing this is because I see that this is an opportunity to actually um, like unite the rural and the in the urban school districts in Vermont because education and equity is important for all. 
And it isn't, I'm not doing this just for Winooski. I'm really doing this because I believe that this will help benefit all children in Vermont. And I think that is the ultimate goal um, of this coalition. So I think at this moment, I'd love to open it up for questions for people um, that to ask between um, Rory and I um, and Mark. Thank you so much. <clears throat> questions? Presentation oh, couldn't have been that good. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just want to thank you. Um, I've been part of the listserv, so I've been kind of listening in for the past year, but haven't been able to put things in my brain to get here. Um, so I guess in terms of the your actual coalition, you have individual school boards and you have individual school board members and the school boards as a whole that vote in for your coalition, is that is that right? So our membership is made up of, of um, uh, school district boards and supervisory union boards um, who are represented by individual school board members. Um, and, and we also have, um, uh, like Rory talked about, some superintendents and business managers um, that, that are um, active with the organization and help steer um, our policy decisions. Yeah, and so I am wondering in, if uh, some school board members are not representing their whole school board because there's no consensus, just trying to figure that out. Um, yeah. If, yeah. Yeah, it, any school board member is welcome to, to join and be a part of the, the coalition, um, even if their board has, has chosen not to, um, not to join, absolutely. And and I, what I do you think is the, the priority right now uh, in terms of pushing for the, I, I'm, I, we've been thinking and talking a lot about the ELL piece of it. Um, and I'm just wondering where you think that's going. I think our priorities for that is like get you know do the recommendations of what the, um, researchers of Rutgers and UVM have said and really push weights, but also weights for ELL students because it makes no sense to exclude them from um, the the counting system. Um, it, it seems even discriminatory in in my opinion. I'll, I'll just add that um, Senate Finance. I'm sorry, Senate Education. Um, we'll, we'll probably be voting on a recommendation later this week um, to Senate Finance um, to go with the weights for ELL. Um, it, it's something that the coalition has been pushing very hard on, um, and we do believe that that's the direction that they're going to take at this point. Of course, what happens when the bill gets over to the House, assuming it gets to the Senate, is a whole other story. Um, there'll be a lot of, lot of work to be done over there. Hi, thank you so much for coming tonight and giving such a um, great presentation. I also I had a question around the um, hybrid, uh, poten the potential for a hybrid option being proposed and where your coalition stands, stands on that and, and what that would look like, like what, what would exactly the hybrid be between waiting and grants? So um, the proposal that's being made in Senate education in regards to ELL um, it is the position that we've actually been advocating for, um, which is to implement um, the ELL weight as recommended by um, the UVM and record study. Um, and then for districts that have um, low incidence ELL, a number of ELL students, um, to provide a, a small grant on top of that so to, they can ensure to that they have the necessary resources to build up their program um, as needed. Um, the recommendation that we believe is gonna be coming out of Senate education is for um, a grant somewhere in the range of 25,000 to $50,000 um, on top of um, the weights. And, and we absolutely, that is by far, we believe the, the best um, situation possible at this point. Okay, thank you. No problem. Yeah, so, I mean, so the caveat that this is complex and I have not delved near, nearly as deeply into it as I um, would like to. Uh, I really like the idea of the weights and the flexibility it gives districts um, that has a lot of appeal 
just a question, what sort of safeguards can or will be built in to ensure that the money is actually distributed to the students that really need it? Um, I, mean, I think if you give districts too much flexibility with the money, is there a temptation that they might, you know, not increase spending, but just let property taxes go down and and not, you know, and that money not might not trickle to where it's needed, which is the students. So coming from a you know rural district that's persistently under the old system bumping up against the excess spending threshold, yet that's not necessarily a marker of inefficiency. It's a function that we have a lot of students with additional needs, and um, our discretionary spending is typically um, totally wiped out by uh, urgent you know facilities needs that come up year to year, or alternatively, um, we have a significantly above average number of students who receive special services. So for us, we need the breathing room to have spending capacity for just the regular operations. You know, for example, we had to close um, a playground because we can't find $60,000 spare in the budget to replace it. And that's the type of choices that are happening in a lot of the smaller rural districts, even right here in, in Washington County. And, um, you know, so I think that there may be an anomalous district here and there that will want to realize some tax savings. But I think that for um, many districts like Cabot, we need a little bit more to um, be on a level playing field. And again, I, I don't think the work of AOE or the state is going to stop in terms of trying to ensure efficiency that our you know, student to faculty ratios are in accord with where the state wants us to be. Um, but that's somewhat separate from this um, just baseline of how we can equitably access um, state education funds. I also just got to admit, like in watching how we progress throughout this whole thing, and I've watched parents and, and teachers and superintendents come out and constantly protest. I actually haven't heard any of them really say like, hey, you know what, we want to do this because we don't believe in investing in our community and like we want to hold the tax capacity low. Because I think in the long run, and, and, I, and I'm, I was amazed by how many students actually want to be on your community that they're going to hold you accountable too to make sure that you're spending the needs, right? Like, like, like and, and the same thing in Winooski, we're going to have our students that are going to be telling us like, hey, like, what are you doing there on the school board? Like, there's a lot of checks and balances by keeping it in the local control arena. And if you're a school board and anything, and this is something that we work closely with the, uh, um, when we went, went made a, a pitch to build our new school in Winooski, I, you know, I think all of us often believe that the school district is the heart of our community. If you don't take care of your heart, you're not going to have a long community in the long term. And I think, um, but giving us the taxing capacity to actually spend wisely, judicially, and, and making wise investments in our children will pay off for not only our school districts and our student, and students, but also our communities, because they will want to come back and stay in the community for the long term. I, I think we've, we've found, I, I know my experience is, um, I have not spoken to a single board member um, who has um, any desire to reduce taxes with the additional taxing capacity. Um, these underweight districts have been hungry for the resources for you know, up to a quarter century at this point um, and are going to take advantage of, of every dollar um, that they can possibly get their hands on. Um, and I'd, I'd also say that um, uh, the State Board of Ed is, is opening up um, EQS standards. Um, the, the EQS rules, um, and we are advocating for stronger EQS rules um, so that that would be how school boards and districts are held accountable. Excellent. That's super, super helpful. Um, I see Libby has her hand up. Yeah, I was just curious, Mark, if we could go back. You, you said a, a couple comments ago uh, when you were talking about where the process is in the legislature about you weren't sure what the House was going to do about it. I was wondering if you could like say more about that. I'm, I'm very curious about what your thoughts are from the legislative process. Well, um, House, like I said, House Education or Rory said, or Alex, somebody said, um, House Education hasn't started taking this up yet. Um, so it's really hard to know where, um, where their heads are at. Um, House Ways and Means um, has been looking at education funding um, since the beginning of, of this session. Um, and there are a number of members of that, that committee that are advocating for the cost equity, the, the grants model. Um, so, um, you know, our, our hope is that they will take a bill that is sent from the Senate that um, advocates for the weights um, and make it better 
um, not worse by changing it to um, to the the grant program that they've that the task force had had recommended alongside the weights. That's helpful. I'm, I'm on I'm in the via uh, Vermont Superintendent's Trustees Group as a trustee for Washington County, and there are five or six of us that testified to Senate Finance a couple of weeks ago, and and two to a person in the trustees group, as well as the people who testified, were all in favor of the equity um, equity version of the bill. So we hope that that, that's why I was curious, is, is if we need to do more advocating for that, we certainly will, because the trustees are behind the equity, the equity idea, or the waiting idea, I'm sorry, the waiting idea. When, when it moves over to the house, I, I, your testimony will, will be invaluable. Um, there is no question that, that um, having the number of superintendents lined up um, and to a T all green um, made a difference in the eyes of, of the Senate. Yeah, finance. I think it totally did too. Yeah. So thank you for doing that. Yes, really, thank you. Really I have a question. <clears throat> yep. Thank you all for, for coming tonight. And um, I appreciate I appreciate this issue that you've been working on. It's It's an important one to our state. In terms of the cost equity model, and I realize you're, I'm asking you to explain something that you're kind of opposing, but just, just for this board who is really just wading into this issue, can you explain what the proponents of the cost equity model are champion, championing? Like why, what are the advantages of that model, alleged advantages of that model? that um, a number of legislators are, are interested in it for? Um, so let's start with simplicity. Um, we all know how complicated our education funding system is. We're all board members and have to deal with making, you know, putting budgets together annually. Um, a, a, a fully grant run model um, would be a lot easier. We, that would do away with the concept of equalized pupils um, and hmm. would go, um, a use of uh, long-term ADM instead. Um, so it would be closer to the actual number of students in, in our schools. Um, so there's, there's simplicity. Um, and, and a number of um, legislators believe that it is actually more equitable. Um, I have a really hard time understanding it because uh, the concept of, um, of cost equity is they take an average of the, the spending throughout the state and that's the amount that is provided to um, every school district for every child, um, every student of that type of, um, who's that type of learner. Um, and in essence, um, in the presentation, um, one of the slides we didn't go over towards the end, there's a picture of a bell curve. Um, and in essence, what uh, the cost equity model does is you'd have a handful of districts that are right in the center that are getting exactly what they need. Um, and then the remainder of the districts are split in half. Half of them are going to be getting more than they need and half are going to be getting less than they need. Um, so um, I, I suppose if I completely understood um, why they are advocating for the cost equity, um, I, I might feel differently, but they, they've yet to explain it in a way that makes any sense to me. Um, and I understand the math behind it, um, but and I'd be happy to go over that in, in, in detail with, with any of you. Um, but it just, from an equity perspective, it does not work. I'll maybe be more, you know, direct. I think that politics plays into it where uh, there are, you know, some members from communities that feel that the, any change is going to be detrimental to uh, taxpayers in their district, which is, you know, respectful to advocate on behalf of them, of course. But I think that comes with also the notion that districts that have been historically underweighted by the current education finance system are, not going to invest and instead are going to just realize you know, tax savings, which I think is detached from the reality on the ground in a lot of the districts that have have need and need you know, greater or more equitable access to funds. So in some ways, you know, I've, I've joked in our meetings and said it's a very paternalistic you know, system of trying to mandate that that's going to be done. Um, I don't think our business managers or superintendents would love the idea of then having to you know account for how this is spent. And I think it would add complexity to you know, it may simplify the formula, but I think it would add an immense amount of complexity to the day-to-day -day operations of a supervisory union or particularly a school district. 
Thanks for that. And so that the board's aware, there was a comparison chart that came out, I think it was last week by Brad James with the AOE that went to Ways and Means. In Vermont Peel, you're looking at weights versus cost equity when modeling that against our FY20 spending, would be looking at like a 10 and a half percent increase in taxes with the weighting versus like 15.1% in terms of cost equity to get at what um, Rory was just talking about. Wait, with the weighting? It's about 10 and a half percent increase. And with the cost equity, it's? 15%. So more? Yes. Okay. Just in terms of a local taxpayer impact. Right. Yes. For Montpelier Rocks. Higher impact on the tax rate with the with the cost equity, yeah. also known as grants. Yes. Okay. But then there's they also had a and I can send this to everybody. There was also they also modeled the ELL grant plus the weights. And I'm not certain. I don't think the original weight had a weight for ELL. So. Oh, okay. And that's in the middle. It's like twelve percent. Okay. For for taxpayers of Montpelier Roxbury Public Schools. Okay. Um, if you'd like, I could pull up the slide that has all the information for Montpelier that that you're speaking of. Sure. 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 Thank you, Mark. Super helpful. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, while he's doing that, I have a question for us, which is, are we deciding something tonight, or are we or are just taking the information in? Uh, What's our echoing? I mean, I think we can can talk about that. Um, what are the decision points? Well, I, I would be just... interested in passing a, a resolution to um, join the coalition. That that seems like well. Can I ask a clarifying question of the coalition? Is there a way to endorse what you are um, advocating for in the legislature without formally joining the coalition? I'm just curious. I'm not like. I, I, I'm just trying to know what our options are. Or is it like join this coalition because we are advocating for for this certain model in the legislature? Um, I, I'd say the latter. Um, it, you okay. know, for, for us to be able to to give the uh, number of students and the number of districts that, that have joined um, is is impactful to legislators. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So um, on, on this slide, it, it's showing um, the tax rates, which are are used kind of as a proxy for taxing capacity, just because it's easier for people to understand. Um, and all the way on the left hand side is um, your tax rate from FY20, um, and that may be slightly off from what you saw in your tax bills, only because that does not include any Act 46 incentives um, or any um, excess spending penalty um, uh, amounts. Then in, in column A, um, you have the weights that were recommended by uh, the task force, along with ELL as a categorical grant. Um, column B um, are the weights with ELL as a weight, so the, the entire package of weights. Um, the next column C is your cost equity with using ELL weight number to come up with a dollar figure. Um, so it's still a grant. Um, and then column D is kind of, um, it, it, it's from the original report. Um, so the original model that was recommended, um, the task force made some policy changes that, that changed the weights. Um, but you can see what, it would, what you would have been if they were to implement the weights from the report. And then the last column is um, the, your ELL grant number um, should it be um, a grant in column A and C, um, and it's approximately twenty-four thousand dollars per ELL student, and for you, it's you know one point two million dollars, which is substantial. Wait, so are, you, are you saying that bottom left number is what bottom right? Bottom, thank you. Bottom right number is what Montpelier would receive if it was ELL grant. So yeah, that bottom row are all um, the numbers for your district. Um, yeah. Most of them based on uh, the uh, Brad James most recent um, documents. Um, so if they were to go with uh, the weights with ELL as a grant or with cost equity, the um, the cost equity payment or the grant payment that you yeah. would receive for ELL is at one point two million. Okay. 
Thank you for explaining all of that. It's very, very helpful and the, that you walk us through that. The hybrid model that you're that you're most in favor of is not represented here in these columns, correct? Um, no. It's that, hard that, to that, come up with that number. Right. So that would be um, it would be column B. Um, plus, if you had fewer than twenty five um, ELL students, um, you'd receive an additional twenty five to fifty thousand um, okay. dollars as a grant. Um, I just and, oh, sorry. Go ahead. I, I was just going to say the um, the the way the twenty four thousand dollars per ELL student was figured was based on the weights um, was based on the two point four nine weight. Um, so it, it's while the math doesn't work out exactly, um, it, it's relatively fair to say that you're going to um, the amount that would be received in taxing capacity by districts is going to be in that neighborhood um, of twenty four, twenty five thousand dollars per ELL student with the weights. Um, it just won't be in a um, in a single check that you receive from from the state. And what's the number on the bottom row, just so I'm clear, is that? Tax rate. Tax rate. So yeah. Over tax is that, is that the, how the tax rate would differ as the 1.512 yeah. 2020 now and those numbers, what they would be under the various proposals? Correct. Um, and it's all based on FY20 numbers. Um, the, yeah. the, the task force chose to use FY20 because um, that was a complete set of numbers and it was um, prior to the pandemic. So um, it didn't, uh, didn't have all the federal funds involved. So I have one more question as well. Um, so it looks like it's about a one and a half cent increase on the tax rate, roughly, is what we're looking at. If we, if we yeah, if we support, if we support um, the coalition, if we join the coalition, that's sort of what the model that we're looking at. Um, Grant, our business manager, had said at our last meeting, I think it was our last meeting, <laughs> that um, that there's a possibility, or maybe it was Libby that said there's a possibility of it's, sort of it's um, much larger than one and a half cents. So. Yeah, it's it's about sixteen cents. Oh, 16 cents. Sorry, yeah, it's like a ten percent increase. I, I I I hate to give you the bad news, yeah. but yeah. okay, I'm not reading the numbers so. right. <laughs> Um, Sorry, so ahead. anyway, they said that they would maybe roll that out over the course of several years or a few years as like, it would be like a slow introduction of this new rate rather yep. than all at once. How would that work? Um, well, they haven't worked out the details yet, um, but they will be rolling. Um, the, the transition period will be somewhere between three to five years. Okay. Um, just to, to give you some reference to that, um, Act 60 was rolled in in three years. Um, and Act 46 was rolled in in five years. Um, but it will be a, a roll-in period um, so that um, both districts that are receiving additional taxing capacity and are losing some taxing capacity um, have the time to make the changes necessary in order to, to utilize the taxing capacity that they have available. Um, there, there may be some additional um, funds that are available to help um, districts that will be losing taxing capacity. Um, but none of that has been um, kind of feathered out yet. Um, you know, there are federal funds. Um, there's a surplus in the um, education um, fund, but I wouldn't count on that. Um, I'm just letting you know that it is a possibility, but I absolutely would not count on that happening. And I just want to clarify for folks, when we're talking about losing tax capacity, we've seen that even in the past year in a city like Burlington, where tax rates went up considerably, they had a really important bond vote that did not get that did not pass as a result of those increased rates. So, you know, there are, that's just an example of the type of issue. Just to, just to add to that, Andrew, I'm sorry to jump in, but it, it doesn't matter if they, if the legislature choose equity or categorical, or I'm sorry, I don't know why you're saying that, um, to change the weights or categorical grants, because either way, we are going to have an uh, increased tax burden. Um, it, it just doesn't matter for Montpelier Roxbury. Right. The equitable weights are a thing that the statewide soups, in any way, support quite, quite a bit. That's yeah. the way to go for here going forward. And most districts benefit from these proposals, period, right? It's like, I think it's like two thirds of districts 
And what I say by benefit, I'm talking about from a tax capacity perspective. I want to be clear for everybody. What that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about um, it. It may, for two thirds of districts, it will make it more affordable for their taxpayers to fund education. And for a third of districts, they will they will take on that additional tax burden. Right? We're talking about a closed loop system. Um, and Montpelier is one of them that would see the tax increase. Uh, Mark, do you, right now, and I, I don't know the answer to this, I haven't looked closely, but I have followed your general work and I, I do appreciate it. Are there any other districts similar to Montpelier in terms of the tax capacity situation that have joined your organization? Because I do understand, I, I, I do think it would be pretty symbolic. So, um... Washington Central um, is, is another um, um, district that was overweight. Um, they were overweight in the the original um, uh, in the original report. Um, they're a little bit closer to, to even um, with the modified weights. Um, uh, and the same with with Peachum, which obviously is not similar to to you all, but um, but but they did join knowing that they were overweight. Um, while my own district, um, which is River Valley's um, school district down in southern Vermont, um, while the district itself um, would probably see a slight increase in taxing capacity, um, my own town, um, which is Dover, um, would, would actually see a tax increase. Um, and um, so th there are, we, we do have districts that, that and towns that have joined um, because they believe it's uh, the right thing. Um, so. I hope that answers your question. Uh, <coughs> Other questions? Oh, yeah. Hi. Um, so my question, um, just lost my train of thought. Um, I guess my question is, so and this is maybe going a couple steps back to the study and the findings of the study that to more equitably educate our students across the state that we needed to bump up the weights, that those were 20 years out of date. And I'm curious, as we look at what those bump ups are, um, you know, how significant are they? You know, and I know this is the work of PhDs and, and things, but do we feel like the bump ups are adequate? And I'm curious from your perspective, Libby, do you see like an immediate use for those funds? If we're talking about bump ups in the categories of ELL, students are experiencing poverty. Um, and if you all might actually just clarify where we're seeing the increases in, in the weights. And then Libby, I'd just be interested to hear from you if you have any like immediate sense of, of how we might dedicate those funds. So like Jim was saying that we know that it's actually, it's, it's getting to the students in the programs that, that really need it. We won't have a through, through Whatever happens, one of these two things is going to happen, and we won't have any additional uh, tax capacity to play with. So that's, I don't know how to answer your question because there, there isn't an answer to it. We won't, we will have to figure out how to maintain the capacity we have with a um, higher tax burden. Okay. Yeah, so we'll likely have to raise taxes to keep the same level of services. Okay, okay. Um, that's yeah. helpful to understand. Yeah, but that's to raise it to like 10, 15 percent. Yeah. Which on... It may though, Andrew, it may not be as high as what, because you're using 2020 guidelines, right? Or 2020 um, taxes and, and pupil counts and all that kind of stuff. And we've had a significant increase in our population of English language learners because of the the families from Afghanistan who moved into the district. So it, it's not exactly that, um, it's a model, right? So, um, but but either either way, we will be thinking about as a board and administrative team, how do we understand our new tax burden with the capacity of need we have? Um, it will we'll be just be having that conversation. Luckily, it will also most likely be combined with a new CLA with appraisals coming in. For the yeah, next and a follow-up question to that is, and I don't know if you've run the numbers, but for, for towns like Montpelier, when we raise the taxes, I, I think we're a town that can afford to generally raise the taxes, with the exception of there's 
you know, as we raise taxes, Montpelier is already a tough place for uh, people of, of lower income to live. Do the, does kind of the current property tax relief and income sensitivity adjust for it? So, I mean, I have a bit of a fear that this might make, you know, towns that are already somewhat not economically diverse more exclusive because there's a higher burden to, to housing and to entry. Yeah, the current system, if you earn between, if a household earns between what, 47,000 and 130,000, um, they, that those households would see the same increase as those who pay purely on property tax. So it's lesser than those who pay solely based on their property value, but the increase Still might be seen. So if they were paying $4,000 instead of $8,000, they would see a $400 increase with those other yeah. Yeah. But that's going to happen with either scenario. Yes, yes. Or yes. any of the four. Totally. Yeah. Okay. So uh, getting back to what are we doing to, with all of this information tonight, I'm also fully on board with joining the coalition. I mean, our superintendent is already advocating for the same position that they are advocating for. It will, it will strengthen the coalition to have a town that is in that one third for whom the tax rate will change in the you know negative or however we want to say that increased tax burden. And while they have, it sounds like they have momentum now, um, they may run into some challenges once it gets into the house and having the weight of a district like Montpelier as part of the coalition, I think would really um, benefit the, their efforts. And it feels like, honestly, <laughs> not only are their efforts the most equitable way to handle um, distributing education funds throughout the state, but it's also like not that, what they are advocating for is not that much of different, not, not any, not, well, while Montpelier and Roxbury as a district may stand to have a, a higher tax burden as a result of all of the efforts that are happening, what this coalition is advocating for is actually not any more detrimental to us. I, it feels like a no-brainer to me for us to join this coalition. Brett? Um, I just have a question about where I'm hearing us say we're talking about two choices, but I heard three choices. So when we talk about weights, are we talking about weights with the grant, meaning the hybrid model? Or are we talking about weights without the grant? And is there any way of knowing how many districts have less than 25 ELL students? Because that kind of matters for those places. I and mean, it doesn't change my support for this, but I'm just curious how many districts have less than, is there a way to know that? Is it something that's estimated? Is it data that's public? Is it not legal to make it public? Um, we're at the legal, the end size is 11. So anybody above 11 would have to report it out or would be okay to report it out. Um, the other thing I would say is is typically, and Mark, please correct me if I'm wrong because you probably know way more than I do about this, but typically if there's a low population of English language learners, there are other weights that would also help that district typically maybe in more rural places. So that, that is often the case. Um, it's not definitely not always the case. Um, and, and I can give you, um, the, the numbers are, are public, um, as, as Libby mentioned, if you give me a minute, I can pull up, um, I can pull up some numbers for you. Um, I just don't have them right in front of me. At this no, that's okay. I mean, so when we talk about weights, we're talking about weights with the grant. We're talking about the hybrid model or we're talking about, yeah, we're talking about, um, all of the weights. And then on top of it for ELL, yeah. you'd have the, um, the, the small grant um, for low income. For, um, for the smaller communities, for people with a small number, because you can't have a successful program without. So you, know, floor. you need a full time yeah. teacher. And we anticipate there'll be more districts that, that have an increasing number of, of students as you know, Afghans move in and, and, and other communities um, like that. Well, yeah, and we also have uh, outside of the refugee population, we do have a lot of farm workers that live in some of the rural areas too that have a lot of family. So it's not, this is not just for our refugee community, but it's also supporting our migrant farm workers and their children. 
Um, so I, I, I would love to join the coalition for many reasons. One, because this is moving our equity work forward with other school districts for the state. These are like-minded boards that you know have equity at the forefront. It just diversifies the resources and the amount of people who have different voices uh, that bring different voices to these conversations, all united in one front. So I think, I think it's a uh, for me at least it's an operator. So I would love to join. Other questions, and then we can maybe move to discussion about action. Well, thanks everyone. The presentation was super, super helpful. We really appreciate the perspective yes. and the answers to the questions. This is really important work you're doing, and uh, appreciate all the all the. I know this for most of you, this is volunteer time. We put into it. We really appreciate all the all the the effort um, and engagement that, that you've done. Um, and again, thank you, thank you so much for for coming tonight. Um, thank you for uh, for inviting us. Um, we really appreciate. Uh, um, the inv invitation and for you considering joining, um, it would be a pleasure to have um, you as members. Um, and I'll, while I hope you do join, um, even if you don't, any of you are more than welcome to join um, uh, and attend our meetings um, and, and participate. Great. And actually, can I have, ask one question on the, the decision point um, before us this evening? Um, what is the role of the what what is the role of each of the districts like what is the opportunity for input like you get what i'm saying mark like so we join on obviously that there's like the symbolism there but you know what is what is the commitment do we have individuals who regularly attend your meetings do do are we involved in strategy you know what is what is the involvement what does that look like as much or as little as you'd like um, quite honestly, um, I, I would hope that um, at least one of your members would attend. We we have um, we do meet every Thursday um, for about an hour. Um, we meet from five to six p.m. Um, more than one of you are more than welcome to attend. You're all welcome to attend. Um, we don't have any any kind of um, formal process. Um, we get together and we discuss. Uh, we we get updates from the the lobbyist and we discuss. Um, any decision points, um, and we make a decision as a as a group. Um, so we, we really have, have all. Um, it, it's pretty amazing. Um, the coalition is is made up of of districts from uh, kind of every walk of life in Vermont. Um, it's it's a, a unique group, um, especially as far as um, education goes um, in this state. Um, to have so many people um, uh, agreeing on you know something that is so important and, and so important to the state. Can I just add that I've been really grateful for this coalition because as a school district that has a very high ELL, when the task force first recommended the wage without ELL, a lot of the school districts could have left and said like, no, we're, we're happy with what the task recommendations. And actually all of them came out strong and said, that is ridiculous that they would think about like leaving out the ELL students as a way and, and, and I think that's what makes this coalition really special is that like our goal is equity for all students. And I think that's why the coalition is Coalition for Vermont Student Equity. Thanks, Alex. Thank, Thank you. you. And uh, if we do join, just let you know, Mark. Is yeah, there anything to it? Um, you send me an email. Um, I, I'm happy to, to hang around. I know Alex needs to, to go and yeah. Rory has a, a family to um, probably to, to go to, but um, I'm happy to hang around if, if you'd like um, further um, to answer any questions. Um, but yeah, you just let us know. Um, my email is, is on the presentation. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's really a pretty simple process. Thank you. <laughs> so I think we also have one other question on the table here, which is, uh, you know, tonight, do we also make a donation? You know, so there could be a motion to have the resolution to join the coalition with the donation or just, or separately to join. And we could discuss the donation at a later point. 
I don't know. I have those the sample resolutions in front of me, so I can um, read one if people are you, feeling you, one way or the other about that. Can you send it via email resolution? Yeah. Jill had her hand up. Too. I was just wondering if we were taking action, or since this was discussion only, if we weren't voting to join the coalition. We can definitely take action. Yeah, we should take action. Well, thanks. <laughs> uh, so, open, a motion? Yeah, if someone wants to put a motion on the table, we can put a motion on the table and then discuss it. Uh, uh, I move to join the Coalition for Vermont Student Equity. I second. We have discussion. Yep, we have to have discussion. I want to just, so my general thought on this, and I feel like I should kind of step back since it's my last meeting, but I, I think there's a lot of merit to this proposal. And I think there's a lot of value that can be added for both this board and, and that commission by having us on there. There really is no other, I mean, for, for this organization, there really is no other district that's in a situation like ours, that's true. Uh, and so I understand you know, this idea that something's going to move along. But my understanding is that there are a lot of other districts in our seat from a tax perspective that are um, not trying to be a part of this process. So I think that is, you know, that's, I, I think that's a really big deal. And I think it's a big deal for this organization and this whole movement. And it is a movement that I personally support at a statewide level. Um, my only concern about this board right now is I feel like this board, and, and I might be off base here, but I feel like this board could use to better understand the situation a little bit better. But if people feel like they have the understanding they need to move forward, I'm not going to get in people's way on that. Um, I do think it's, it's going, I think how this is implemented could be a really big deal for this community, though. Um, you know, if, if we do have a 10 to 15 percent uh, increase in tax rates, it will cut it into the free. And I just think it's important that we realize. Yeah, that. and to go back to Mia's point, it's and what Libby said is um, either option that the state moves. I mean, there's momentum behind this that changing the weighting, and so either way, either direction that the state decides to go is going to be a, a pretty similar increase on our taxpayers, um, and in fact. And maybe I, I was moving decimal points around earlier. So it sounded to me like it was going to be actually less of an increase if we go with the coalition's recommendations. It is. It is less so I'm increase. not sure why our community wouldn't be supportive of that. Um, and, and, and I think like what Amanda said is sort of leading with our values around equity is what's driving my interest in, in joining the coalition. I'm kind of interested to hear from other people who have yeah. I mean, I think I'm 85% there and I don't believe go to the board. The, I mean, my only hesitation is one hesitation you have. I, I don't, I feel we, I feel that Mark and everyone, you've done great work. I also feel you come in with a perspective and it would be great to hear from a neutral perspective just to, you know, someone who does not have a stake to give a comparison because it's very complex and I don't fully understand it. Everything you said makes sense and I trust you on your word, but yeah, usually when I make a decision like this, I like to hear multiple perspectives and certainly perspective from the folks who have would count as, as not part of a group that already has a stake position. That's my only hesitation though, but my my instinct is that it would probably confirm what we heard tonight. But I don't know that because I haven't been. If I could just say one thing, um, I don't know that you'd find a neutral person um, to, to speak to. <laughs> I, yeah, I know, or even like a broader view, but I, I'm thinking even someone like, you know, um, a legislator who's been deep into it, who who might be able to at least kind of tell us about the voices they're hearing. Well, the, the both, both the, the co-chairs of the um, of the task force would, I, I'm not going to speak for them, but it wouldn't surprise me if they'd be willing to come in and, and speak to you. Another recommendation I can make, Senator Perchlik was part of the task force and sits on the 
Senate Education Committee and as representing Washington County, uh, he came and spoke about this to the Cabot School Board in December. Yeah, I had Andy in mind. Yeah, he, he spoke to us along with the rest of, most of the rest of our representation a few meetings ago. Not specifically on this issue, it was more of a broad conversation. Well, I would also say that there's a lot of YouTube of the, every legislative session where this topic has come up. So all the voices are there if you want to just take the time and you, know, you could streamline instead of having one meeting, school board meeting on it. I think we can take the time. Can you say okay. that again? I'm sorry. So there, like all the voices have come to the Senate Education Committee. So if we want to just do a list of all the people that spoke there so you can get a sense of what the conversations is there. I mean, that's a little bit of more, it's a little bit work versus like just bring one more voice here. Because, you know, I, I, I agree that there, I don't think there's going to be a neutral person that's going to, that we're going to find if that's what we're trying to find. Joe? I think um, I was I was very similar to you, Jim. That I'm I'm pretty compelled and also hesitant to sort of jump on the bandwagon when it's really exciting in the moment. But um, as someone who spends a lot of time in those committees and has watched education legislation over the years, I'm I I know I say this a lot that if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. So I like the idea of being part of an informed coalition that shares. Um, our understanding and our approach and that would inform us as a board and obviously has eyes and ears. Um, and I think also what was really compelling for me is to hear that um, I'm pretty sure the school boards association is also trying to steer the legislature back yes. to the original proposal to hear that the superintendents are largely aligned in that way. Um, I think it's, it's pretty glaring that, that there's pretty large scale alarm about where this could go. And to your point, Emma, about if the, if, the, if Vermont Pillar is, is going to feel the impacts of this one way or the other, I'd like us to be part of um, part of a group, like I said, that's informed and that um, that sort of helps the state as a whole and may, in fact, selfishly also help our district more than some other. So I'm um, I'm I'm in support of joining the coalition tonight. If that's helpful. Thanks. There is also a time factor here too, where, and Mark mentioned this before, it's gonna be coming out of Senate finance soon. And I, I, I don't know this, but I speculate the reason why it's in the Senate is because it's more regional rather than in the house. There's gonna be a lot of skirmishes. Um, it's because it's at that, that more micro level, mm -hmm. which is where these impacts are, are, are felt um, more acutely. So, there is that factor to this as well. Which is good to say, act sooner. Yeah, no, I'm more beneficial. I think I'm pretty much there. I, I, just, I just want to put out there that someone asked me if I'd really done my homework and, and fully understood the decision. I'd have to say, uh, not as much as I would have liked. Can we push a decision to the next board, line, board meeting and at least give it a, you know, a, a timeline that? I mean, I'm hearing that we also there's there's an urgency yeah. um, uh, in terms of moving from Senate to House. I mean, it's two weeks. Would I'm you... worried that with the vacation, and we did discuss it at the last meeting. Andrew brought up the same concern, and I invited Andrew to try to find somebody to come to speak at this meeting. I'm worried, and and you know, provided a lot of resources for people to educate themselves between the last board meeting and this board meeting. And so I'm worried that that won't happen again and that people will feel pretty similar at the next board meeting that they do at this board meeting. So I'm concerned about pushing it ahead with also the vacation and the timeliness that Andrew talked about of movement in the legislature. And they also, they take the week between the week of town meeting off from lawmaking and then usually the week after that or the week after that is what's called crossover where it has to have gone to the other side. I'm very concerned about the slide that showed where the four different major money and education committees are in such different places. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm a little worried that in two weeks, a lot is going to happen. Mm -hmm. I, hate to, I hate to put that pressure, but that's. Mm -hmm. No, let's, let's do it though. It, it, it's from my perspective, it's, it's 
it's very symbolic. There's no other, there's no other district that's in our position that's joined this coalition. And, and we also it's... don't have to have a unanimous vote on this, right? It uh -huh. just has to be majority. Yeah. And, so, and I would vote, I would vote yes. I mean, but right. if people aren't comfortable, you could abstain and or not or vote against it. I would just add that it's a coalition, which means that we can give input in these changes. We can be part of the conversation. Yes. And so that it is not, we're not voting, hey, yes, Mark, we everything that you're gonna do, we will be part of the conversation and ensuring that the conversation flows. So I think that, I mean, I, I just don't see it. I vote yes. And Should we move to a vote? vote? Yeah. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Great. Thank you so much, Mark. You can, you can put us down. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Rory. And thank you, thank you all very I, much. I would like to talk about potentially making a donation at the next board meeting. Thank you, Mark. And Amanda, thank you for yeah. suggesting this. It was just like two weeks ago in Roxbury that you really pushed us to hear from these folks. So thank you for making that happen. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, thank you for for joining. Um, we do have a um, an email list um, where we send out kind of updates as well as a, a weekly update um, from the um, from our lobbyist, um, which we welcome all of you to join. Any of you, kind of, right. don't force anything on anybody. Um, but we absolutely would would appreciate your participation in in meetings. Um, it would be a big help. And thank you. Um, I think it will make a Definitely make a difference. It makes a statement, as as you mentioned. Yeah. Thank you, Mark. Good. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Have Bye. a good night. You too. So I think we're ready to go into executive session. Um, since this is not for negotiations, we just need a simple vote to open up executive session for purpose of uh, personnel. super and personnel and. Um, Personal evaluation, we should say. Personal evaluation. And the students. All right, so moved. Second. Second. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Great, thanks. I guess we got a one of the six or whatever that is. Oh, I understand. Is that room locked? One, room 126 was locked before, yeah. but we'll, we can find a classroom. Representative spots replied um, and came tonight, and it's really, really a tough decision because you're also incredible, and I think you're great representatives of the um, Roxbury School community, and so we're all thrilled and excited um, to have two of you be joining us. I do want to say that we discussed, you know, the momentum involved with um, people having interest right now in serving in this capacity and that we can harness harness that momentum and potentially you know build some systems maybe a subcommittee where um, the two student representatives could sort of lead a process by which all the students who were interested um, to serve as the two appointed positions could still have a voice and be involved um, so I will reach out to Matt McLean on that and we'll sort of brainstorm together with the two student representatives about how best to do that, but we definitely want people to stay involved. Um, the other point that was brought up in executive session is that no senior, uh, no seniors applied, which is actually great for us because that leaves this poss a possibility of any of you um, applying again to be a student representative in the fall. So please keep that in mind. Um, I'm gonna make a motion that we appoint Merrick Modoon and Zach Henningsen as the two student representatives to the Montpelier Roxbury School Board. Second. Second. Any, Any discussion? discussion? Yeah, in terms of the timeline, because we just talked about in the fall doing this again, what is the timeline of this appointment? We discussed it um, during the other, during regular session, which was that this appointment would be through um, the school year. Yeah. So these two appointments run through the school year and then we'll have another process to appoint two more for the next school year. And I'm not sure at that time if we wanna potentially do it as a semester long appointments or if we wanna do I mean, full year. In the year past you've had it as a full year. Yeah. yeah. Uh, which I think is. 
And so the first meeting is the two board members who will be invited March to as official second. members would be the day after town meeting. Then. Yep, yeah. our second. March, second. March 2nd, Wednesday, March 2nd, and it will be here at the Montpelier High School Library. Great. Thank you again to everyone. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, yeah, really thank appreciate you everyone. all of your. Do we need to have a vote? Yes, we do need to have a vote. Oh, yeah. Or um, any more discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Yes, no, thank you so much. And now I need a vote to go back into executive session. But Aye. yeah, I'm really looking thank forward to Thank you both so much. Yeah, and thank we you. We look forward to having you at the next meeting and definitely let's keep brainstorming ways to yeah. keep everybody involved. So um, we're just. You know, really excited to have all of your voices. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I want to encourage, you know, everyone who who submitted and didn't get chosen to, you know, stay involved. And I think we'll work with with American Zach to figure out ways to do that. Um, and then, you know, as as Emma noted, um, you know, we will be doing this. Most of you will have one, if not two or three more times, to to serve. And hopefully, we can get get all of you on on the board before graduating. Yeah. Thank you. Thank Great. You. Thanks. Good Thank night. you so much. Thank you. Um, I move we <laughs> we go back go into back into executive session for the purpose of discussing personnel evaluation. Second. A second. Aye. All in favor. Aye. Aye. Okay. All right. Now there, well, Now we. Now Orca. Yes. Is,